Good afternoon, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. I mean, right after Halloween's over, it's pretty much Christmas until January. So, you know, but really, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, so this is the time of year where we are starting to prepare for Thanksgiving coming up on Thursday. Um, we're getting in that attitude of thankfulness, of just appreciating the, the blessings that we have, especially here in America, even more so here in L.A. And that's fantastic. As it says in 2 Timothy that we are to preach in season. And so it is in season of preach about thankfulness. That only makes sense. Um, and I think it's, it's absolutely good to be thankful. There is definitely, um, I think this entire topic has been covered very thoroughly by sermons out, even outside of our denomination that like, I think we've all heard Thanksgiving sermons before. And I don't think that's bad. I just think that it's been done. And so I wanted to talk about Thanksgiving but I want to talk about more than just the action of giving thanks. Um, I think it's absolutely good <laughs> to give thanks. As we see in the Bible, all throughout it, it talks about giving thanks in just all types of situations, whether you're in mourning, whether you're praising God, whether you're in plenty or in want, whatever. We see it all throughout the Bible that we give thanks. Absolutely, it is good to give thanks. I'm not here to... To dispute that. And if we don't give thanks, we run the risk of going down a slippery slope that leads to a lot of unhappiness and just being discontent with our, our life if we're not thankful. And so absolutely be thankful. And what I want to talk about was something that I believe that can be more important than being thankful. Because this is something that begets thankfulness. And that's contentment. I want to talk about contentment today. Um, and I want to talk about what that looks like. Because you can be thankful without being content. But you can't be content without being thankful. <laughs> contentment begets thankfulness. But it doesn't work the other way around. And so, in some ways, I think being content can be more important than thankful. But I'm not saying thankful is, is bad. <laughs> in no way. Don't take that from here. Um, let, me, let me define these terms for us, just so we're all on the same page. Just so we're all like, uh, my, my, my idea of thankfulness is, is this. And my, my idea of contentment is this. And so I just want to define this for us. And so I was looking up online a definition for both of these, and it was so interesting when I looked up on Webster's, it said, Thanksgiving, the very first thing was an expression of thanks to God. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was the, the formal definition of Thanksgiving. I thought it was just giving thanks, but it actually said giving thanks to God, which is kind of cool. And then right under that, it was like, oh, uh, it, it's a holiday we celebrate in North America. <laughs> and so I looked past that, and I was like, well, I need something more. What's, what's giving thanks? Let, let, me, let me define that. And so it defined that as an expression of gratitude. Contentment was defined as being satisfied, happy. And so one we see is an expression. It's an act. It's something we do. While the other is a state of being. We are. But I want to look at what the Bible says about this. And so let's go into Philippians 4, verse 11. And so this is where Paul is writing his letter to um, the city of Philippi. And he says in verse 11, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. And so we all can agree that Paul has, in his time, been around the block and what he has done, he knows that contentment lies not in what he has, but whose he is. When we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we understand whose we are and what we have. 
A lack of contentment will cause us to look horizontally. It'll cause us to look at what others have and what others are doing. We will see people that are always, somehow, always someone that is richer than us. It's always going to be someone richer than us. Always going to be someone more, more buff than us. There's always going to be someone smarter than us. There's always going to be someone more talented than us. There's always going to be someone more than us, no matter how elevated we get in this world. And we will never be satisfied. We'll always be looking horizontally, and there's always going to be something better out there for us. But con contentment invites us to look vertically. It causes us to look at God. And when we look in that direction, when we look up at Him, we know that regardless of our circumstance, regardless of the horrible things that happen to us or the amazing things that we're blessed with, we know that we have enough. A man once went to a minister for counseling. He was just in the midst of a horrible financial crisis. He was just crying, he was weeping, he was just banging his hand on his door to just get his attention. He goes up to him and he says, I have lost everything. He just bellowed it out of him. I have lost everything, Pastor. And the pastor says, oh, I'm sorry that you've lost your faith. <laughs> no, the man corrected, I haven't lost my faith. Well, then I'm sorry to hear that you've lost your character, the pastor said. I didn't say that, the man replied, getting flustered. Well, then I'm sorry that you've lost your salvation. <laughs> And that's not what I said. And this man is just angry now, right in the face. This pastor's not listening to him. The pastor says, you have your faith, you have your character, and you have your salvation, it seems to me. You've lost nothing that's really important to you. And we haven't lost that either, no matter what we go through. And with that reality, knowing that we maintain all of that, we could be like the Puritan <laughs> and have his prayer where he would sit down to his feast of some bread and some water and he would bow his head and he would pray and declare all this and Jesus too? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, he passed away, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, a famous evangelist by the name of John Stott. And he once wrote, Contentment is the secret of inward peace. It remembers the stark truth that we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Life, in fact, is a pilgrimage from one moment of nakedness to another. So we should travel light and live simply. Our enemy is not possessions, but excess. Our battle cry is not nothing, but enough. We've got enough. Simplicity says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And for, for us Christians, contentment knows that when we have Jesus, in the truest sense, we have enough. In Philippians 4, verse 12 through 13, moving on with Paul's letter, he says, I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And as Paul tells us, contentment is learned. I'm positive all of us here in some, at some point in time in our life, whether we are that person or we have encountered that person, but we have seen people who, for some reason, life just seems to be exclusively unfair and unjust and hateful towards them in a serious sense where 
they have just had a horrible life, just bad thing after bad thing after bad thing until they're here and Thanksgiving and it's still bad and they just went through a life of hardship. Whether they were, whether it's one of us here or someone we've encountered in our life, they were just was born out of, I was a crack baby at birth and my parents left me at two, I had to start working at three, I picked up smoking at four and I started drinking at five, I had my second marriage at six, and they just go through all these things. And then they're like 26 and they're like, and now I'm here. And I think we've all, joking aside, I think we've seen those people where they just, for some reason, you're like, how is your life that hard? How, how has life been this rough to you? And I think the astounding thing when we see those people, I've seen them, I've seen both spectrums, one who are just bitter and angry towards the world, and the ones that astound me are the ones that have been through all that, and yet they still are grateful to God. They are still happy to be alive, and I am so astounded, and I am humbled that they have that <laughs> level of contentment in their life, despite everything that is thrown at them. How could they do that? How could they be that content in their life? The other week, uh, Ron actually came up to me uh, when I was back there fidgeting with the sound. And he was talking to me about this hymn. I'm sure a lot of you know it. It's, it is well with my soul. I don't know. I'm sure most of you here know that song. I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to sing it. Regina could, but I'm not going to ask her to. <laughs> And so it is well with my soul. That song, I had no idea of the background, the history behind that song. I'm going to paraphrase it largely, but it was written by, or composed by a man named Philip Bliss. And this was in like 1865, somewhere way back then. He had a son that died at the age of two. He had a business he was running, and after his son died, his business failed. To just find some relief, he wanted to go on a cruise. He wanted to relax. And so he and his, how many was it? He and his four daughters and his wife, they were going to go on a cruise, but he had to fix some stuff up at home before he went. So he sent him off ahead. And then on that cruise, the boat sank. His four daughters died. And all that was left was his wife. And then after that, he had three more kids. And then one of those kids died. And in the midst of all of that, Grief, since losing one kid could take a lifetime to heal over. He's lost a total of five. And in the middle of that, he wrote that song, It Is Well With My Soul. And that's a very content, deep, joyful song, despite the circumstances. And I think it's just amazing that he is able to have that level of contentment with Christ. And that level is learned. It's not something we're born with. We don't just born, we're not just born content into the world. A baby doesn't come out of the womb and just be like, thanks for giving birth to me. I'm doing pretty good now. Uh, thank you so much for always cleaning me when I'm pooping everywhere and all that stuff. <laughs> Babies aren't like that. We don't just have that innately in us to be content. We have to learn it. It takes time. We have to cultivate this mentality and this posture through intentionality, it becomes a lifestyle of contentment. And so during all of this, I'm not saying wanting stuff is bad. <laughs> not at all. It is fine to want stuff. I want stuff. I want the food that's back there that we're about to have in a few minutes. I'm so excited for that. I want to go on a vacation one day with Regina. <laughs> I, want, I want stuff, and that's okay. Everybody has desires. I'm not saying condemn yourself because you want something and just be content with only bread and water like the Puritan. <laughs> it's not at all what I'm saying. It's okay to want stuff. But what contentment is, is exhibiting the freedom over the negative aspects of wanting things. The thought, once I get X, Y, and Z, that's when I'm gonna be happy. That's when I'm going to be satisfied. Once I get that raise at work, that's when things are going to be really good. Those thoughts will lead us to unhappiness. It causes us to look horizontally. Because guess what? Once you get a raise, 
There's always a there's always someone who makes more than you after that. You can always get a, another raise after that, and another raise after that, and it can keep going forever. We won't be satisfied. We'll be discontent. And so, contentment exhibits freedom over that kind of desire. And those thoughts and feelings, we need to exert freedom over that. Otherwise, we become shackled. We become imprisoned by them. And we only lust for the next thing after the next thing after the next thing <laughs> ad infinitum forevermore. We will always want that. And being content isn't saying everything is okay <laughs> when the world around you is collapsing, when your job has just been lost, when your spouse just passed away, when your kids are just gone and you are left with nothing and your world is shattered. No. <laughs> Contentment isn't saying, well, that's okay. Uh, I'm glad that happened. No. We're human. When a bad thing's happened, we grieve. We're sad. We're hurting. And that's okay. I'm not expecting you, any of you to have that mentality. You're just in for a world of hurt if you're thinking it's okay for bad things to happen to you. It's not okay. But in the midst of that, contentment is displaying peace that comes from knowing Christ is superior, he is bigger, he can overcome the problems, the hardships that we encounter, that he is able to be our rock, our Ebenezer, as we heard in the song we sang. He is able to conquer through these things and we can find peace and contentment even in the midst of the hardest trials. The secret to being content is Christ. We remember the cross, the cornerstone of everything Christ came to do, his death. We remember all of that and know that that was for us. That was so that he could provide everything that we truly need. We don't dwell on the past, that will just lead us to more sadness. The shouldas, the wouldas, the couldas, all of those things, but didn't. <laughs> I like that. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, but didn't. Um, we could dwell on that. All the times we have spent in the shower replaying arguments in our head and winning them in our head <laughs> after they happened <laughs> and thinking in 2020 hindsight vision where things are perfect, because I can tell you for sure I could have had a perfect life if I was just 10 minutes ahead. <laughs> we know that Christ is sufficient. We know he is enough for us. In Philippians 4 verse 13, I just want to repeat this. Paul says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. The only reason Paul said that, and the only reason he could say that is because Christ is, was, and will be sufficient for his needs and ours. And so when we come to this time of year, Thanksgiving, of course, give thanks for the things that we have. I'm not telling you to be ungrateful for any of that. Of course, be thankful, but be content also in knowing that all of our needs, all of our wants, are met in Jesus Christ, and everything else is just extra. Amen? Amen. Amen.